Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Animals and Entertainment in China and Vietnam. Thank you so much for joining us today and greetings to those who will be watching the recording on YouTube. I'm Lu Shigai, the co-founder and the managing director of the Institute of Animal Law of Asia, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Institute of Animal Law of Asia, or ILA, is the educational research center that focuses on animal law issues in Asia and the world. At the ILA, we provide research projects which include animal law in Asian countries, on topic, on category, and on species animal law articles. This year, we have launched a few external projects uh, which are enhancing <laughs> legal regulations for aquatic animals in Kazakhstan, farmed animal welfare in mainland China, and amplifying the interests of animals in Kazakhstan. Um, all of them are supported and sponsored by the Center for Animal Law Studies, Lewis and Clark Law School. We also have our new source, Asia Animal Law Bulletin, which provides the latest updates on animals in Asian countries and regions. And last year, we have launched the Alliance for Animal Law of Asia, which is the international networking campaign that aims to cooperate with national, regional, and global animal organizations to improve the awareness of animal protection through legal education, collaboration, online events, and webinars, and inviting experts to share their experiences with our audience. Our members are spread all across the globe from Asian organizations in China, India, Japan, Indonesia, and Vietnam to organizations on other continents, including North America, South America, Europe, and Africa. Since the beginning of this year, we have held quite a few webinars. In case you missed them, you can go to our website, ilasia.org slash events, or go to our YouTube channel, which is Institute of Animal Law of Asia, and find the recordings up there. Please don't forget to check out our website and also follow us on social media. It's iAnimalLawAsia on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Currently, I am serving as the ambassador of the Global Ambassador Program, the initiative launched by the Center for Animal Law Studies, Lewis and Clark Law School. And today's webinar is organized under my project, Enhancing Legal Regulations for Aquatic Animals in Kazakhstan. And I should add, this wouldn't have been possible without the Cal support. Our guest today is David Neal, the Animal Welfare Director at Animals Asia. Um, Dave leads a number of animal welfare campaigns focused on improving the welfare of captive wild animals in China and Vietnam. For example, ending elephant riding in Vietnam. And he also leads a capacity building education program to improve the welfare of all animals, develop animal welfare concepts within the teaching curriculum and humane education initiatives within schools. We'll be answering questions after the presentation, so please drop your questions in the Q&A box. Thank you so much for speaking for us today, Dave, and uh, we're looking forward to learning more about your work. Thanks very much, Lou, uh, and thanks very much for inviting me to come and speak today and uh, to all of the participants for being here to listen. I shall share my screen. And hopefully you can see that, Lou. Great. OK, um, so as Lou has said, I'm going to going to be talking specifically about some of our work which is looking at the use of animals in entertainment um, both in China and in Vietnam just to give you a very brief introduction to Animals Asia Foundation if um, you haven't come across us before more, majority of our work is working on bear protection and rescuing bears both in China and in Vietnam we've got agreements with Chinese, the Chinese and the Vietnamese government at national levels to operate rescue centers for bears, which have mainly been used within the bear bile industry. And we're looking very much to try to close those industries down uh, with an agreement in Vietnam underway at the moment to end bear farming. In addition to that, and something which I've been involved in, is some of the wider issues outside of 
of the use of bears for traditional Chinese medicine. And really, I I got involved in this. Um, for, I've been working for the organisation now for nearly 20 years and got involved about 15 years ago on this particular topic, mainly because we were getting a lot of um, supporters coming to us asking whether with us being based in China and in Vietnam, whether we could address some of those issues that were that were that were coming up. And so we wanted to expand some of our work to look a little bit wider to, 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 to see whether we could help some of these particular animals. Um, so firstly, what do I see this, what do I mean in terms of when we're looking at animals using performances? And I understand you know this may be widely understood. But the things I'm going to be talking about, and the things that we've been looking at in particular, are the use of, of animals in ocean parks, particularly the performances of those animals in ocean parks, so beluga whales, um, dolphins in particular. The use of animals such as the macaques and bears and, and elephants in circus performances, and the use of elephants in particular in Vietnam in both circuses and elephant riding and also in festivals as well so anything which is there specifically for entertainment you could ask the question and i'm guessing most people listening to this will will probably have a good understanding of why it's wrong to use animals in entertainment in this way but just in case so just a just a, a brief run through some of the issues then I think you know we should all start with the, the 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 fundamental basics that animals and the animals which are used in these industries are sentient animals. They have the ex, they, they have the ability the, to experience positive and negative emotions. They can experience pain. They can experience suffering, and also they can experience fear. And and there are there is lots of examples of this in in behavioral research which is demonstrating these particular uh, capacities within the animals which we're going to be talking about today as well as within many other species that aren't used in entertainment and therefore we have a moral responsibility towards the care and the the protection of these animals and particularly the uh, protecting these animals from suffering so i i think that really goes without saying for all of the industries which we're using animals within, we should be ensuring that this is one of our utmost priorities, that we're trying to protect them from, from suffering, um, from, from pain and fear. The use of animals in entertainment causes a huge amount of suffering. We have the physical harm through the use of some of the tools, as we know sometimes within things like elephant riding, the use of tools such as ball hooks can cause a huge amount of physical harm. We also have stress from putting animals into very unnatural situations, which is also leading to animals experience a certain amount of fear. Within both ocean parks, but also within the circuses, then we have very, what are, what are unacceptable and incredibly unnatural living conditions. We can see here, We've all seen photographs such as this of the killer whales in very, very small tanks, but the traveling circuses within China and Vietnam also keeping animals such as these tigers in incredibly confined situations, which are obviously going to cause a huge amount of stress for those individuals. Um, this is just an example of the type of conditions for animals in some of the ocean parks in China and Vietnam. Again, just very sterile environments where it's quite easy to see this kind of stereotypic swimming actions from the animals which are which are kept in these environments. We also have an issue of the wild capture and use of animals in entertainment as well. So on the left hand side of my screen, there's a chimpanzee which is has been wild caught um, and shipped to Asia and then trained for use in circus shows. And on the right hand side is a young bear cub which will have been trapped from the wild and then again sold to a circus. 
So the legal side of this is also something which these this is illegal to do within within China and, and, and Vietnam in terms of use of, of wild animals that have been captured from the wild in these industries. And obviously the issue is trying to actually prove the origin of these particular animals. Um, just again, you can see here, This is the general kind of conditions and tr circus tricks that these animals are being forced to perform. And also from the situation with the marine mammals, then we know that there's the majority of the marine mammals in ocean parks in, in a lot of Asian countries are wild caught as well. So the wild capture of these, particularly of the dolphins, is coming, a lot of these animals coming from Japan, the beluga whales and the orcas were originally coming from Russian waters and Russian, Russian captures and then being sold into China. So we have, from the circus point of view, then we often see issues of see, physical abuse for animals, animals which are being forced physically to perform tricks and then obviously suffering both physically and, and mentally due to that. We also see these issues of animals which have gone through a certain number of, of what we call mutilations. And here you see these are animals which have had teeth removed. Uh, this is particularly the case for animals which are in the circuses within China. Um, where removing the teeth obviously makes it much safer for the circus showman to be in the arena with these animals, forcing them to do something. And then obviously if they get a, an attack, then there's, there's le much less likely to be damaged. Sometimes the, the, the claw tips are being removed as well from these animals to try to make them a little safer for, this, for the circus showman to, to, to work around. And then obviously issues of physical restraint, we're talking about the use of elephants, particularly of elephant riding them. We know that most of these animals are spending huge amounts of time chained uh, in a single spot, um, often on their own, but also in, in just in conditions which are obviously very unacceptable whilst they await for people to come and, and, and pay to ride them. And this, for many animals, is leading to issues as well as the physical abuse, it also leads to issues of psychological stress with animals which are spending huge amounts of time in incredibly unnatural situations. And again, this is quite a common situation for animals in circuses. This was actually in, this is in Vietnam, a place called Monkey Island, which is a tourist resort and it's quite a high-end tourist resort. And from the outside, um, looks in incredibly idyllic and it's a lovely paradise looking beaches and once you sort of look beyond the surface then you see these are this is where these animals are being kept which are then being used to entertain the public and you can see here again just the general kind of conditions for some of the animals being used in these circuses so the majority of the time these animals are spending their time in these incredibly poor conditions and um, both the cacs here and also uh, Asiatic black bear here as well as well as in the background I think there's also some some dogs and some wolves which are used in this particular performance and that's leading to this behavior that we're all very familiar with in terms of this sort of stereotypic rocking behavior particularly within the bears that we see being held in held in these conditions. On, in addition to the welfare issues, then there's obviously huge public safety issues for putting animals into these very stressful situations. These particular examples, which I put here, are from I think the the elephant examples. Actually, a picture from a long time ago in Tyke, the famous elephant in Hawaii that um, killed its trainers during a performance. On the left hand side is a bear attacking a, a circus performer. I think in the Ukraine, but these issues of safety have become some something which 
are apparent both in China and Vietnam, and there's been a number of accidents which have happened with people being killed because of be being in very close proximity to these to these dangerous wild animals. In Vietnam, we've seen a number of people being killed by elephants that are being used in circuses, but also uh, injuries to people from um, people being close to elephants, which are being used in elephant riding as well. And then outside of the welfare and the public safety issues, then one of the major issues that we have with the use of animals in this way is these very poor educational messages that they, they, they portray. And I think this is something which is, which is a, a wider issue really, because a lot of the shows that are put on are attended by a large gathering of people. So they have the opportunity to influence people for better or for worse. And unfortunately, then people obviously watching bears performing or, or elephants standing on their heads. There's a very negative message about the way that we treat animals and, 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 and our relationship with animals. And yet these institutions, the, the ocean parks and the zoos and the safari parks that have these animals are in a fabulous position really to try to provide much more positive messaging about the cognitive abilities of animals and the emotional abilities of, of, of animals, of, about animal sentience and, and these things which really we need people to have a, have a better understanding of to be able to appreciate the animals for their as individuals and also then have a, a willingness to want to protect these animals so the educational message is obviously completely opposite to what we're trying to portray for this particular industry or particularly for animals and circuses we're obviously in a, a big change in public and a political climate um, it's, this is from a protest in the UK and the UK has actually dragged its heels very much on this particular issue of animal use in circuses and has finally um, come to, to end in the use of wild animals in circuses within England very recently after, a, after many, many years, many, many organisations which have been campaigning to, to try to, to change that. The situation in China, there is now a public outcry. It's still very small. It's something which we have worked with a number of activists based in the country to, to, to support, but there are people now which are publicly protest, pro protesting against the use of animals in circuses. This is actually outside of a arena in Beijing, the Beijing Workers' Stadium, whilst there is a, a circus shows going on inside. And you see, this then creates the public, some, some public attention, which allows the activists then to try to get their message across. And similarly in Vietnam as well, so this is um, members of the public protesting outside of the Hanoi Central Circus, which is the biggest circus, static circus based in Vietnam. From, from what we know, we're, there are 48 countries around the world now which have either banned or at least limited the use of animals in circuses, so that may be limiting certain species from being used in, in animal circuses or the import of certain species to be used in, in animal circuses. And we know that that environment is beginning to change, thankfully, for the, for the better. We obviously still need to do a huge amount of work, but it's good to see that that, the, that that legislation is beginning to happen. And in addition to that, we're starting to see this move towards the use of holograms and, and um, technology to be able to replace animals. So this was one of the recent um, advances in Germany with the use of holograms to replace the animals in this particular circus. And this is something which we're very hopeful will grow as commercially for the circuses to start to adapt this, this particular approach. And in particular hope within places such as China where there is a huge amount of investment and money that's going into some of these circus shows, then hopefully as we can change public opinion away from the use of, of live animals, then the hope is that the circuses will start to switch to investing in, into this more um, alternative technology approach, which already exists.
In addition to that, we have seven countries which have banned the use of cetaceans in captivity and subsequently in their performances. And again, that's something which hopefully will will develop with more countries as we, again we start to learn more about the needs of keeping particularly um, some of the dolphins and, and whales in captivity and the difficulties of keeping these animals in captivity and in terms of the development of alternatives then this picture actually shows an animatronic dolphin rather than a real dolphin so again there's, there's there is a huge opportunity there from a technological point of view to try again to bring in new um, approaches to try to change the the landscape here in terms of the way that people interact and learn about these wild animals and using things like animatronic ro ro robots is something which which I think will allow people to have some interaction with these animals and learn about them without actually having to have the live animals there themselves. And again, just there is the use of these holograms as well, which which are uh, which will advance further. So here's a, a humpback whale hologram being used in a school. Again, this is something which can really help, I think, in terms of trying to get that awareness out to children, giving them an experience which is right in front of them without obviously having to have a, have a live animal present. And this technology will just get better and better over time with the hope that this is the route to changing the way that we use animals or at least changing the public's perception of animals to a more positive route so that people actually start to demand to see this technological advancement more so than the, the live animals themselves. Looking specifically then at how this impacts and what we're doing within China and Vietnam, then we've been working now in both of these countries for, for many years, um, mainly doing the, the background investigation work, documenting the species which are which are being used in this in the circuses documenting how many circuses there are documenting the the travel around the country for of, of the way that these animals are being treated within vietnam we've put together two very comprehensive reports about that situation the first one was back in 2017 and we just updated that this year in 2021 and and on the back of that, then we gave recommendations to the governments, which was looking at specifically from a legal perspective, the calling upon the government to prosecute any circus owners which are in contravention of the, the, the Vietnamese law with the, the Decree 6 2019, which, which does actually protect certain species which are on class one and class two within this particular law from commercial exploitation. And that's how at the moment we're pushing the government to, to act to try to remove animals particularly like the asiatic black bear which is which is a, a 1b species and elephants which are 1b species within vietnam from any use and exploitation within circuses and we're beginning to have some success i'm, I'm glad to say uh, back in 2019 the ministry of culture which is the ministry which provides the permits to circuses to be able to operate, instructed some of the facilities to stop using wild animals in circuses. And that followed reports which we put out publicly and some public opposition. And that was the very start then of what we're beginning to see is a, a change in the public perception of the use of animal wild animals in circus performances within Vietnam. And actually since 2017, when we put out that report, then we've actually seen 16 circus shows which have stopped using all animals, both wild animals and domestic animals, and seven circus shows which have ended the use of some species. So circuses which have stopped using orangutans or elephants and Asiatic black bears, but may still be continuing to use animals like macaques and parrots and other species. But the the trajectory is definitely in the going the right way in Vietnam. Um, and there are now fewer circus shows in Vietnam in 2021 than there were in 2017. And we're also being able to help 
rescue some of those animals and, and accommodate some of those animals as well. So I mentioned at the start, we operate a bear rescue centre in a place called Tamdao, which is north of, of Hanoi. And we've managed, we've taken some of the bears which have been transferred from the Hanoi Central Circus to our Tamdao Rescue Centre and then provided them with, with sanctuary. We also work in partnership with the Hanoi Wildlife Rescue Centre, which is a government rescue centre which takes in um, animals which have been traded illegally as part of the illegal pet trade. And we have taken in 13 macaques which were being used in the Hanoi Central Circus, which were transferred then to the Hanoi Wildlife Rescue Centre. And we provide support to the rescue centre to be able to accommodate those individuals. So the, the as I say, the, the, the movement uh, is, is going in the right direction, particularly within Vietnam, with less and less animals being used and less circus shows because of the, the pressure that we've been putting on and the awareness raising that we've been done. And just from a public awareness point of view, then we regularly now hold things such as exhibitions in train stations and museums, trying to, again, document and just put across some of that messaging to the general public about why, why this is happening. And this has then also led to things like media exposure within Vietnam. We obviously put out a huge amount of information through the both traditional and social media. Again, just trying to expose some of the issues that we have and that we come across as, as when we're investigating or when the teams on the ground are, are, are investigating some of these issues. And, and again, trying to change that public opinion against people going to these animal shows. And we also run a schools campaign as well, because a lot of these circuses, particularly the static circus in Hanoi and in Ho Chi Minh, operate to get a lot of their revenue from schools coming on a regular basis, on a daily basis to, to visit the circus and, and, and obviously paying to be able to, to do that. And at the moment, it's, it's, it's in its infancy, but we have had five schools, three in Hanoi, two in Ho Chi Minh City, that have committed not to visit the circus. And we hope that that will be another pressure point on the circuses to remove the, the use of their animals and to change into using much more human acrobatic performance performances. Uh, for China, then the situation is very different. Um, Animals Asia are not in a position to operate within China um, f f on this particular issue. It's something which we have a permit to operate with regards working with the government on rescuing bears. But we do, we are in a position to be able to provide support to activists on the ground who are trying to address these particular issues. So there are two two particular organizations, one which translates Freedom for Animal Actors in China, which is looking specifically at the issue of the use of animals in circuses, and the China Cetacean Alliance, which is an alliance of organizations, international organizations, specifically looking at the problems of use of animals in the ocean parks. And so we provide support to both of those organizations. Most of this at the moment is through public exposure and public exposure through Weibo and WeChat, obviously the, the main channels of, of being able to get information out publicly within China. Um, online awareness activities has, has reached some, something around 30, over 30 million people. Some of our physical advertising that we've done on the ground, we estimate has reached over 26 million people, but as we know, you know it's, it's a country of 1.3 billion people, then there's still a huge amount that needs to be done to try to get across these particular message, messages. We do see some very good um, numbers and followers to some of the posts that we put out. So again, we have investigators or these organizations, I should say, have investigators and volunteer investigators out visiting the circuses, visiting the ocean parks, documenting some of these performances. And we can then put some of that video out, particularly if there's a case of an animal which is being abused. Um, as in the case of the bear, yeah, there was a, um, uh, the, trainer was abusing the bear during this this um, training session and, and this these sort of things receive well in the four to five million viewers there was actually a post back from 2017 which which received over 200 million viewers and again this was from a a video of a tiger which would be in, which would be abused during a performance of the Hangzhou safari park the tiger then was 
was sort of forced off the stage and the other tigers all all came around it and you got this impression that there was a huge amount of stress and a huge amount of fear within this within this group of tigers that were all kind of looking out for each other and that video how stressful it was for the animals actually really does help us to be able to get that message across in terms of why exactly it is that we want these things to to stop from the animals point of view and again they get very good coverage just from a circus situation, there are a huge number of traveling circus shows in Vietnam, um, but there are also a lot of the circus show in China, sorry, a lot of the circus shows are taking place within the zoos and the safari parks themselves. So we conduct regular surveys to see what that situation is. And I am pleased to say that it is beginning to go down percentage wise within the actual um, zoos and safari parks themselves as you can see we've done these surveys 2014 16 and 18 and the percentage of zoos and safari parks which are now having animal circuses is beginning to is beginning to decline but still it's still quite a, a large number that still entertain the visitors through these animal circus shows we conduct the surveys on the traveling circuses as well and um, from last year, we, we generally do a, a nationwide survey on the 1st of October, which is China National Day. And this is the day when there is when, when there, is, there is a huge amount, normally a huge amount of circuses operating across the country. So we look for um, all of the public awareness, public announcements that these circuses are operating. And last year there was 105 which were operated on this particular day. Actually, this year that number was vastly reduced, but we think that's probably some more to do with the pandemic than any kind of change, particularly in the way that the public are perceiving the use of animals in, in circuses. Although we are hopeful that you know, with a lot of the public publicity, then this these numbers will start to go down. But there are still a huge number of traveling circuses which are legally able to operate within within china from a legal perspective then the one directive which has been issued in china which actually has an impact on the use of animals in circuses is this one which was actually issued now 11 years ago back in 2010 by the ministry of housing and urban rural development now this is the ministry which is um uh, it, which oversees the zoos the traditional zoos so beijing zoo shanghai zoo guangzhou zoo etc and it was this ministry which in 2010 bans the use of animal performances in these traditional zoos and that's why as you can see from that survey then we're beginning to see that going in the right direction and the more of these traditional zoos end their contracts with these circus shows which were operating inside the zoos then let then they don't they don't renew those contracts and so we're seeing less of them in those zoos unfortunately the situation in china is that the different types of facilities are managed by different ministries so the larger safari parks are managed uh, are managed via the forestry authority and they don't have the same directives in place so we're still seeing those circus op circus circuses operating in some of the bigger safari parks and at the moment really it's only public opinion which is going to going to change that we're also seeing some provincial government directives which have been issued as well. So Suzhou, Zhenjiang, Fujian provinces have all issued their own directives which are restricting the use of animals in circuses for various reasons. Um, Suzhou province uh, is the main area where a lot of the traditionally the animals have been trained and been bred and they have actually restricted their circuses from operating outside of, of the province, which is which is good news. So hopefully there'll be less circuses which are being able, given permits to be able to travel to to operate in, in other places, in other parts of China as well. So in terms of just numbers, we know of um, 29 of the traditional zoos which have closed down their circuses in recent years, mainly due to those, those, those directives. We know of over 40 traveling circuses which have, have to have been suspended. Now, this is because of public opposition to a lack of permits. So this is mainly to be able to travel with 
the animals that are, that are that the circus operators are traveling with, then the operator needs to have various permits, such as breeding permits, transportation permits, and often, up until recently, then they've been operating without these permits, without anybody really checking. So it's really the job of the activists and the volunteers that we work with to try to ensure that these circuses are operating under the under the 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 way that they should be in terms of the the the, the legal um, permits are in place and often they're not and if they're not then we can get the local authority to take action to at least suspend the services from being able to operate until they have those permits and this has also happened in some of the marine mammal shows as well so there's a lot of operators which are which are traveling mainly with seals and sea lions working operating in things like shopping centers again without the permits to be able to operate and if we can if we can expose those then in a number of cases it, the whoever it, the management authority is either the shopping center or the local government will actually suspend the circus show from operating we've also been able to close down a number of um, websites which are hiring animals um, stop a lot of these public interactions so people which are having their photographs taken with with certain animals and there are three local authorities that have actually banned the use of animals or wild animals in shows in these international circus festivals which are quite popular within China as well so although there is there's still a huge a long way to go within China there is some positive movement at least in the direction of travel with regards some of the local authorities beginning to see that it's not something that they want to be associated with and then from the ocean park perspective again we've done a similar thing here to what we said within the circuses within Vietnam where we've been operating with investigators for a number of years just documenting what has been happening so we put out um, uh, regular reports on the on the situation the industry the, how the industry is currently operating the number of ocean parks the number of animals the conditions for animals and these are then being being translated obviously sent out to the Chinese government put out publicly to try to raise awareness of the situation situation as we currently know it is that there are 84 ocean park facilities which are currently open and operating within China. There are a further 31 which we know of under construction and those 84 we estimate to have uh, around about just over a thousand and eighty cetaceans which are being held in in captivity and if you look at those numbers back in 2015 and you can see that that's increased it's doubled since about 2015 in terms of the actual number of cetaceans which are being held in these ocean parks just to give a breakdown of those uh, individuals the majority of those individuals are bottomless dolphins um, and then beluga whales, so the dolphins mainly coming from the Japanese drive hunts, the beluga whales coming from Russia. But in recent years, then we've also seen um, orcas, uh, killer whales. So there are estimated 16 killer whales now, 15 of which have been captured from the wild in Russia and imported into China. Um, and one of those has, has, um, has had a, a calf. So there are 16 uh, that we know of in China at the moment but there's only one facility in China which actually publicly has these on display which is the Shanghai Haichang Ocean Park. Again our public awareness is, is the key to trying to change public opinion on this and all of the messaging that you are no doubt aware of in terms of why the it is it is not acceptable to keep animals particularly the cetaceans in captivity are regularly put out via the Weibo and WeChat um, and these are reaching uh, over upwards of 100, 170 million people across China but again there's still a long way for us to go to be able to change the public opinion on the use of these animals and the development of these ocean parks continues to 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 happen so you know we're a long way from being able to address these issues um there's been some success stories in that the over the years that we've been working on this particularly um there was recognition from the ministry of agriculture which is administers the 
ocean parks within China. That changes were needed, this was back in November 2017, to both improve animal welfare and to limit the import of wild caught animals in particular, improving breeding success. Again, this was after all of the negative publicity which had been put out there, mainly through the China Cetacean Alliance channels. And that has led to the ocean parks looking to limit the number of um, wild caught animals that they bring into the, into the parks. And then more recently, there was the cases, the case of the killer whales and the beluga whales, which were ended up in trapped in what was called the whale jail in, in Russia after being captured for export. And many of those were on their way to China, but um, that was stopped and it was blocked. And many of those ended up being released again after, after a, a long period of being kept in captivity in Russia. And that has actually changed the, um, the, the situation with when in Russia at the moment is that there's no longer any permits being given to the capture of killer whales and beluga whales and so therefore that we're not seeing any new killer whales or beluga whales coming into the ocean parks at the moment but again that situation still may well change in the future as the demand continues to grow for these animals within China. Um, in terms, again, just from a public awareness, this is just a short video which shows some of the work that we've been doing to try again to promote those alternatives to people within China. Been doing this for a number of years. This was a video from some of the work that we did back in 2017 as part of the Ocean um, Film Festival, both in Beijing and in Chengdu. And this was working with a company in Japan called Light Animals, which again uses this sort of these screens to try to. Um, allow people to interact with an, wild animals through these through information through the the wonders of the holograms. And again, it's a hope that the organisations, the ocean parks which are operating will start to take up this technology and, and at least start to offer this technology and, these, this, these, and, and advance this technology 
alongside maybe the use of live animals and then hopefully the public will start to be able to make their own mind up in terms of which one they actually prefer to to associate with and then finally i mentioned that we we're also looking at the issue of the use of elephants particularly in elephant riding um, and we have a program in vietnam which is addressing this particular issue um, in Vietnam, there are, it's a quite a small industry in comparison to other Asian countries. As we know there's a large elephant riding industry in places like Thailand and in Myanmar. In Vietnam, then it's all pretty much within one particular province, the Daklap province. And we've been working in the province now for the last five years to develop a, a relationship with the government, developing a relationship with the elephant owners to again, look at tackling this issue and ending elephant riding. Just last week, actually, we were fortunate enough to sign a, a, an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding with the DACLAC government, which commits the government actually to ending elephant riding in the province and to developing alternative elephant-based tourism opportunities. And that's, where we are now in terms of needing to be able to work with the tourism operators and the elephants to actually set up these alternative tourism, this alternative tourism model, which will remove all of the elephants in the region from elephant riding. As part of that, in the last couple of years, we've actually rescued 11 elephants from elephant tourism. So this is, we've worked with the tourism operators to compensate for their loss of income and then to, to remove those elephants and then to actually put them into the national park. So we're quite lucky in this area in that we have the natural elephant habitat, which is the Yokdon National Park where there are wild elephants, and we can put the elephants into the national park and allow them to actually roam within the national park within certain limitations, which, which allows them obviously to experience much more natural um, lifestyle and, and obviously removes them from any of those, of the, of the, of those stresses for, that they had when they were involved in the elephant riding industry. This has been done mainly through partnership building. We've been working very closely with a number of people within Vietnam, both from the national government and the provincial government within Daklak, but also the tour operators, the elephant owners themselves, the local um, uh, PPCs, the people's um, committees, to make sure that this isn't something which is just wanting to close down an industry. It's very much a transformation of an industry to ensure that people continue to make money from, from tourism within the region because it brings in a lot of money to this particular province, people coming in to actually in, to, to engage with elephants in what was the old model from, from the riding tourism. So we do need to work very much hand in hand with all of the different stakeholders. And so we've held a number of these conferences which have, which have ex, tried to get to some agreement in terms of how we how we take this issue forward and I'm glad to say now we're in a position where we can take that forward. We had a uh, three years ago 2018 we had a sign in with the Yokdon National Park which transferred which which converted their particular elephant tourism model so they have three elephants within the national park all of people so people could come into the national park and ride those elephants around the national park and they agree to work with us to end the elephant riding and to set up this new model which was watching elephants going into the forest and, and observing the elephants in the national park so this is their um, visitor area in the national park this is this is what it was like up until 2018 so these are their three elephants tong nang boon con and ikun and tourists could just queue up and pay for this this walk around part of the national park now all of those three elephants are free they roam within the national park with their mahout and the tourism the tourists go out and trek into the into the national park to find the elephants and then spend time just observing the elephants um, as a short video just explaining that program it's really
So that's our tourism model, um, which we're, we're operating and and it is very much based around the elephants and the elephants welfare and ensuring that the elephants have, we can optimize their welfare as much as possible. And as we say, we bring, we've, since we produced that video, which was a couple of years ago now, we've actually brought more elephants into that. Unfortunately, due to the COVID situation, then we've had to continue to finance that in much more than we would have hoped because the tourism has pretty much stopped within Vietnam. So um, we, we, we are obviously committed to that program and we're very hopeful that the tourism will begin again. We can start, these programs can start to become financially self-sustaining in the future, but we are now just having to sit back like everybody, wait to see what happens next. Um, just from a local perspective in Vietnam, then it's very important for us not just to change this model without really getting a, an understanding or at least trying to give an understanding to a local community about why it is we want to change this model. So we run huge amounts of activities, public awareness activities, schools activities. You can see here, you know, children's artwork, which is then produced by our educators and then put on display in things like poster exhibitions. And these are all done locally. So this area in, in, in Boon Dong, which is where most of the elephants are, is where the children are growing up with elephants being used in elephant riding around them. So learning more about the elephants and, and why it's important to have the elephants back in their natural environment is particularly important for this, for this particular area. We run a, a, a host of talks and poster days in the schools. We've reached, say, nearly 7,000 students with this message of why exactly we feel it is much better for the elephants and for the local community to have this change of the way that elephants are being are being used. And you can see the, the challenge we're up against really is these, these two images here. The elephants being ridden is something which people see every single day in this region. So from, from a young, when you a young child growing up every day, you're likely to see an elephant, a number of elephants being ridden on the road. So it becomes very normal. So something which is very, it's acceptable, I guess, for many people to, to see these elephants being used in this way. And then the painting is actually on, on most of the schools within the region. In the game, it's showing young children on the back of elephants. So the imagery, I think, it plays a big part in public perception, and we're trying to change that. And we're, we're physically beginning to change the images. So working with schools, who will then start to, to, to start to have a have a greater understanding about the natural the needs and the behaviours of these elephants, the emotional capacities, cognitive abilities, and then wanting to change that imagery. So again, you can see here just some very basic changes, which will which will go a long way in terms of influencing the region and the young people within the region towards seeing elephants and the need for elephants to be a part of a much more open, extensive environment than the one that they're in within elephant riding. And those negotiations now continue. So we are negotiating with elephant owners, with the local government on how to set up more of these projects uh, with the idea that eventually we will get all of the elephants within this particular region of Boondon out in the national park as part of a tourism program and elephant riding will come to an end completely within Vietnam and we say we've got the the agreement to be able to do that and over the next few years hopefully with tourism coming back to Vietnam then we'll be able to achieve that and so I'm going to leave it there I've kind of run through quite a lot of topics from animal circuses and ocean parks to elephants um, but thank you very much for your time and patience for listening and see if there's any questions I'm happy to answer them. Thank you Lou. Thank you so much Dave. Uh, there was a lot of information that I personally found useful. I haven't actually heard of um, holograms and it's pretty fascinating how far we've gone with technology development. It's, it's wonderful. I have a question to you. Um, what are the challenges, what challenges have you faced in uh, promoting and improving the welfare of animals in Asian countries compared to let's say UK or maybe Western countries like the United States, depending mm -hmm. on, of course, there are 
plenty of factors such as cultural background, historical background, and I'm sure there were um, some challenges in promotion. Yeah, there is, and and I, again, I mean, I'm I'm here giving this talk now, but I mean, I'm really just managing teams of people which are on the ground actually doing this, and that's one of the ways that we've we've tried to set this up in that you know my team so to speak is Vietnamese and Chinese and they're the guys which are actually out there doing the work on the ground to make this happen and I think that has helped because when we you know there's always that sort of perception of you know why why are you here in China from you know coming from the UK to to talk about issues in this country rather than doing it in 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 your own country and so we've I've always been very aware of that so that's why say we've, we've set up teams on the ground to be able to do that and that's really helped us because again it's much easier to talk when you when you have that cultural and traditional background um, to, to these situations I think one of the biggest challenges and challenges I'm sure most people face is really just an understanding of animal welfare um you know from a from a sort of historical perspective in in that you know there hasn't been and uh, maybe the same understanding of animal welfare that's been taught particularly within the schools within china and vietnam and there's a there's a lot still a lot of teaching which is about sort of the use of animals as resources and you know a sustainable use of animals is something which still happens in both in in both China and Vietnam and, and probably in many other Asian countries as well as, as well as countries outside of Asia and I think that's something which really does have to change because that creates quite a barrier in that you know it gives this impression that animals are there for us to use um, as, as long as we can do that in a sustainable way and we don't impact them in terms of sort of a, their conservation without really seeing those animals as individuals and I think that's the biggest challenge that we have that's not just happening within Asia that happens around the world I think but I like to think that maybe we've come some way to addressing that in countries like the UK where where the topic of animal welfare is probably discussed a little bit more within public forums and, and within within schools and university settings than it than it than it is doing within China and Vietnam and other Asian countries but that is beginning to change like and that's changing dramatically I think now you know I mean we've got a huge number of people people particularly within the universities in China and Vietnam that are really interested in learning more about these issues and 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 you know beginning to actually um, have a greater understanding of what animal welfare actually means for the animals themselves but getting that to go to a to, to a mass population is, is obviously still very difficult most of the survey work which is being done following circus shows shows us that there's a real lack of understanding that animals are suffering in the circus shows so you know you talk to people that have you know sat with their children and laughed and joked whilst you know you can see yourself that these animals are, are suffering through fear and stress and sometimes physically but it's just a complete lack of understanding from from the perspective of the of the of the general public that that has been happening and i would say that was the same here, you know, in the UK, I'm in the UK now, and that was the same here in the UK, maybe 30 or 40 years ago, in that, you know, circus shows were very popular, and, you know, being frequented by people that didn't go there to see animals being abused, just had a complete lack of understanding that the, the treatment of the animals was actually having a negative impact on them. So I think trying to get those messages into the public conscience is, is probably one of the biggest challenges, but also, you know, goes a long way in terms of changing public opinion. Thank you so much. I totally agree with you, especially I think with the establishment of lots of animal organizations that are um, all over the place. Um, and it, it's a big advantage for those countries and regions where there is um, lack of awareness and uh, absence to access any educational materials. Uh, let's see, there is the question, what is the most effective campaign in your opinion regarding marine parks and zoos? Yeah, that's a good, I think probably one well, the most effective campaign so far within China has really been to get the ministry to, to bring in that traditional, the ban on the traditional zoos used in the circuses. I think that came about quite quickly after we started to work within China on this particular issue. And that really came about 
because there was obviously still an underlying kind of sense that this was already something that needed to change, particularly from some, the zoo association themselves. So the, the, the zoos mainly, they come under this, this Ministry of Urban and Rural Housing. And then as part of that, there's the China uh, Zoological Gardens, which then most of the zoos are members of. And what we found when we started to look into this issue, one, we wanted to work collaboratively with the zoological gardens in terms of animal welfare improvement for animals in zoos. So we have a lot of expertise in managing animals in captivity, particularly through our sanctuaries and the bears that we have. And we wanted to sort of offer that expertise to people within to to animal keepers within China and animal managers in China to hopefully improve the welfare of animals which are being held in the traditional zoos. And at the same time, then that then allowed us to, to work more positively with the Zoo Association. And once we started to expose some of the real issues with regards to animal circuses, then they came on board very quickly. And I think that, that was what made that change in that they could see that the, only, the future for the zoo industry in China was to, to improve its, its international reputation and go away from this centers of you know, animal entertainment and abuse and much more towards conservation education, which we've seen the sort of direction of travel for zoos around the world. And so that was very successful because instantly we started that campaign. We knew we had somebody on the inside, the China Zoo Association, which was linked very much with the ministry um, on our side and we could influence that. And so we're, we're very pleased with, with how that's gone. From the marine park side, there's just not been much success at all, I'm afraid. And that's something which again is going the opposite way. Um, and I think that's the case you know, not just within China, but in, 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 in other countries, particularly in the Middle East as well at the moment, in that, you know, there's a huge amount of profit and, and um, which is being made from these, from these um, establishments. And at the moment, they are offering a lot of entertainment for people to come and see animals like beluga whales and killer whales and dolphins in, in circus shows. So we still have a long way to go with that campaign before we start to see success. I, my hope is that, you know, we're starting to see some success around the world, particularly with the United States in terms of the change of the way things are happening with SeaWorld. And, you know, we very much hope that that will be the catalyst, at least, for the change in public perception and the change in the conditions for animals within places like China. But at the moment, you know, we, we are still seeing that it's uh, there's still huge issues to be to address there. I think. Vietnam is a different story altogether with regards to animal circuses and the elephant riding as well. And again, I think this comes about mainly because we've been working in the country for such a long time, positively with the government on changing the, the um, situation for bears, particularly within the bear bile industry, opening up sanctuaries. We employ a lot of local Vietnamese staff. We've got very good relationships with the government. And so We've had the ear of the government all the way in terms of being able to say, you know, these are other industries within this country which we want to change. Now, the circus industry, we really we're not trying offering an alternative as such. We are just trying to say we need to end the use of these animals and circuses. But the elephant riding, we are, and I think that has been probably you know one of the the most successful campaigns and and in terms of animal our, our work on animals in entertainment, because not only are we trying to ends to 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 end the use of elephant riding or the elephant use of elephants in riding tourism we are actually offering an alternative and we are compensating elephant owners to go to get involved in that alternative as well so from an economic perspective the finances are there and they're guaranteed for a number of years whilst we set up these alternative models and so we've really looked at this from a you know the, the whole sort of perspective of the economics and the and the cultural significance and said we're not trying to remove your elephants from you we just want to change the way that you use them to raise your income and that i think is probably you know one of the best ways to go because that then gets a lot of people on board in terms of you know yes you're not just trying to stop me from doing something you're actually helping me to change the way that i do something which potentially may actually you know earn more income further down in in the future for for these individuals oh that was a very interesting point and the relating question to the first one is 
um, let's see, in your opinion, would it be beneficial for animals to strictly regulate the operation of zoos and ocean parks or ban them completely? Um, I think regulation at the top for the time being is probably the way that that's what will, will is what will happen. There is regulations within the China uh, zoological gardens and the ministry now in terms of what the zoos can and can't do. Um, I don't I don't think any of anybody's going to push for a complete ban on the keeping of animals in captivity, particularly within China and Vietnam at the moment, it certainly isn't the landscape to be able to do that. I would very much like to see an end to the keeping of cetaceans in captivity. I think there's, you know, there's there's obviously arguments not to keep any animals in captivity, but for particular animals like cetaceans, then you know there's a huge amount of people which are far more qualified than I am to talk about this from a research perspective. But you know the evidence it certainly suggests that it's very very difficult to keep animals such as orcas and bottlenose dolphins, beluga whales in a situation where their welfare needs are being met. And so I would like to see those particular species or uh, those groups of animals from uh, being banned. But I think in the short term, it really is trying to stop the wild capture of animals for these ocean parks, because that obviously is causing a huge amount of, of individual animal suffering for these animals being captured from the wild and then put into these very stressful situations. Um, but yeah, it's a very good question. Personally, you know, I'm not a huge fan of keeping animals in captivity, but I'm also realistic about the fact that it exists around the world and that it is possible to improve the lives of animals in captivity in the short term and I think that's you know that's where we should be at or where we are at at the moment in terms of realistically being able to work on the ground on welfare improvements. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is What's your opinion about the educational side of zoos? Do you think they sometimes may serve the educational purpose? I actually think zoos across the world internationally are missing a huge opportunity to educate people about animals in a, in a much more positive way. And I, in a sense, maybe it doesn't happen because if people were to learn more about animals as individuals, then maybe they would see the captivity situation in a different light. So maybe that's why it hasn't happened. I think education in zoos often concentrates a lot around conservation, as we know, which is incredibly important, obviously. And there's a huge amount of good work which is being done in terms of raising awareness of the plight of species. But there is very little, and this is from a, a UK perspective as well as an Asian perspective from what I've seen, very little educational material about the social needs of animals, their emotional capabilities, their cognitive abilities, problem solving abilities, um, things such as you know, the importance of the bonds between individual animals, either socially or from a parent and an infant, how important it is for those particular animals to, to, to have those experiences. And I think the zoos are in a great position to be able to raise awareness of that. I would love to see a zoo adapting its educational messages much more towards the individuals that it has themselves talking about the personalities of the animals that they have and and how they're trying to work to ensure that they have all those social connections particularly obviously for the social animals and 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 how they're meeting their needs through the provision of those social connections um that to me would be very good education from a from a zoo perspective in terms of really getting people to understand how animals really operate within their own world um, but I don't see that happening and at, at the moment I generally just see you know the, the better education programs in zoos are really very much concentrated around species conservation and habitat conservation and so I would very much like to see that see that change, and we are trying we 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 are trying to change that with the collaborative zoos that we work with again through the Zoo Association in China. We have a whole series of 
resources, posters and fact sheets and leaflets, etc., which is looking very much at those emotional capacities so the social bonds between individuals and displaying those and the zoos are taking that information you know on board and displaying that information within their zoos i think the problem for the zoos is that often they might be displaying that information so take chimpanzees you know so we put up a whole bunch of posters we've talked about how important it is for those relationships for individual chimpanzees to be able to develop those relationships as they would do in the wild and yet you put that up in in an enclosure where you have a single chimpanzee you know it obviously shows the, the problem which is existing and i suppose then that the zoos may be reluctant to do that because they're highlighting some of their own fail failures and unless they're actually operating you know with a with a with a large troop of chimpanzees which are allowed to carry out those social interactions and do all that kind of cultural um transmission of of, of skills and social learning and things then they're unlikely to be to display that information to the public because it just highlights some of the, the the problems of keeping these animals in captivity so there's a rather long-winded answer but yeah i haven't found a zoo which has that aspect to its education and i think that's real a real shame and something which zoos really do need to look at yeah i also think it um most of the time depends on what kind of zoo it is, because there are certain zoos with um, horrific conditions. But if you look at another zoo which have uh, which has better conditions, uh, one may think, well, maybe uh, an animal is not suffering here. So yes, but mm -hmm. I personally think that zoos are not educational as long as we humans are exploiting animals. Uh, it is not a good thing shortly. Um, there is a next question about bear bile farming. Um, so for those who you, uh, for those of you who are unknown with this practice, it's briefly the extraction of uh, bile from a live bear uh, and Animals Asia is primarily working. Uh, one, of, one of their projects is the end of bear bile farming. And um, if I'm not mistaken, um, Animals Asia is rescuing bears from um, those terrible farm uh, farms, bear farms. Yeah, and, and yeah, the, absolutely. Uh, so yeah. Okay, uh, and yeah, the question yeah. here is: Do you think there are alternative practices to bear bile farming in Asia? Alternatives to bear bile, definitely. There are um, herbal alternatives to bear bile and there's also um, synthetically produced um, substances which have the same properties that we uh, are aware of within bear bile so the alternatives certainly do exist but i think with any industry then you know there is still obviously still a demand for the real substance itself and that's that's the challenge that uh, we have in terms of trying to shift the the consumer away from consuming the actual bear bile to consuming the synthetic alternatives instead um, but they do they're already very much in existence so and you know many of the traditional medicine associations across asia recognize the alternatives particularly the the um, non-animal plant-based alternatives as having very similar or if not the same properties as bear bile and and have already committed to only promote and to sell those particular products rather than bear bile. But, and, uh, you know, as, as with everything, there is still a small number of people which continue to stick with the use of bear bile and continue to promote it. And, and whilst it's still legal to do so, will continue to do so. Thank you so much. And we have the last question for today. I wonder um, if there are cases in China or Vietnam where animals in captivity or circuses are found dead due to stress, not getting proper care, uh, and what did the government do when they found those particular cases? Has the government prosecuted or revoked their operational permit? No, there hasn't been. I mean, there has been cases. Um, um, particularly um, elephants which have died in, on, in elephant riding camps um, of, of in, in recent years. 
due to poor living conditions or being through attacks, elephants attacking each other, particularly in this area where there are wild elephants as well. So some of those individual captive elephants have been chained and then have been attacked by wild elephants and have and unfortunately died in the hands of a circus operator. And yet there won't actually be any um, legal route taken by the government to, to prosecute them, unfortunately. Thank you so much for the answer. And that's it for questions. Thank you so much, Dave, for being our guest today. The recording of, of the webinar will be available soon. Please check out our website or YouTube channel or follow us on social media to see the recent updates and when the recording will be up. This is the last public event for this year. And stay tuned for more guests in 2022. I wish you all happy holidays and have a great the rest of your day.